Welcome to the Aerospace Ambition Podcast. I'm Marius, your host and an engineer passionate about the intersection of aviation, AI and sustainability. In this episode, we'll explore current research around contrail management. I'm delighted to welcome Manuel Soler, Associate Professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Charles III University of Madrid. Manuel heads the Aircraft Operations Laboratory and directs the doctoral program in Aerospace Engineering. He also coordinates the eContrail project. Manuel's research focuses on applying AI to aeronautical meteorology, air traffic management and climate change, along with optimizing aircraft trajectories. Manuel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Marius. My pleasure to be here today with you and your audience, of course. Thanks, and thanks for greeting the audience as well. I saw that you participated online in a recent event. It was in London. It was the Pi Controls event. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, since you participated, what did you think about this event? Well, I mean, it was it was amazing because it, it brought together uh, quite a lot of experts, scientists, uh, investigating on contrails. Uh, so it was, it was quite amazing. We also have people from operations. A lot of focus was put on, on observation means, especially ground cameras. And I think also the, the PyCon Trails community is making a tremendous effort uh, to, to put together you know, a community with this open source software and somehow empowering us and aviation stakeholders towards mitigating climate change of aviation. But before going into that, we need to better understand the, the impact of contrails, of course, which is a hot topic today in, in research. It is a hot topic. And before we dive into some of the elements that play a huge role in there, you already mentioned the uh, huge attention that was spent on ground observation, especially during that event. And um, there, there was a particular story um, of, of a pilot uh, who basically tapped into a ground observation network, right? And this created at least a huge momentum in the conversations at that event. And I was wondering, do you think that the attention which was dedicated to ground observation is justified? I do think uh, it's, it's a way to go. It's not the only way to go, of course. Uh, it's true that uh, when it comes to... Um, modeling contrails and integrating contrails in, in, in the aviation stakeholders, the decision-making uh, tools, uh, we are still subject to strong uncertainties, right? So the, the existing models, COSIP, ACCF, or even others that are being developed at the moment, are not being capable of fully capturing uh, the contrails, the formation, the, the dissipation, and its impact in terms of radiative forcing. And one way to go is uh, using data, right? Is the era in which we are living. It's been happening in, in many other domains in engineering. Why not in aviation? And indeed, we were working in a, in a project in the last four or five years in which we were leveraging uh, remote sensing devices, so satellite observations, to uh, capture thunderstorms and then integrating those observations into deep learning architectures to uh, develop uh, predicting thunderstorm predicting uh, services for aviation. And that has been super successful. We created a, a spin-off out of that, AI methods. And, and back in 2022, we're thinking, well, well, if we can measure, observe contrails, if we can also put on top its relative forcing, we could then eventually uh, also develop a, a prediction service for, for contrail and its associated impact, right? And using data, available data, to really improve the understanding of uh, contrails impact. Uh, but then we were relying on, on satellite observations, geostationary satellite observations in principle. The, in the United States, we have GOES, which is, has a higher uh, spatial temporal resolution than, than what we have in Europe, which is the Metrosat second generation of satellites. And, and, but the, the fact is that if those satellites geostationary satellites are not able to capture linear contrails when they form and they initially develop. They can only capture uh, long-lasting contrails, persistent contrails, which are, of course, quite important. But if we want to better understand the, the conditions that trigger the contrail formation 
and the initial development. We have different phases, uh, the vortex regime, the dissipation regime that might last for the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Ground cameras can, can play an important role therein because we have uh, resolutions of meters, 70 meters. We have coverages of 50 to 17 square kilometers. So we can really capture, we can really see the aircraft. So we can easily identify the aircraft using ADSV, right? So it might be very useful to validate physics driven models that are being developed. Uh, if you if you think that we are just we are uh, we can really model the evolution of the contrail using a continuity equation, linear momentum equation, and transportation phenomena, so navier Stokes combined combined with uh, some transportation phenomena, uh, we could really validate those models that we are developing in house, and I know other groups are being, are developing such models uh, using these observations. So that's one one direction of work. We can also use this uh, network of ground cameras to patch the information with, for instance, a uh, geostationary satellite or a low Earth orbiting satellite, which has higher resolution than that the geostationary satellite, but still is not able to capture linear contrails. So uh, patching the information as, for instance, um, I don't know, these, these artificial intelligence uh, tools that are uh, creating images, they work somehow in, in, in that direction, right? They somehow, you have information about, about uh, uh, some pixels of the image, some others are unknown, and, and they patch the information with some algorithms. Image in painting is the, the, the type of algorithms they use. So we could also use the ground cameras to really enhance uh, a, a full image of a geostationary satellite uh, and enhance the quality and the resolution. That would be another way to go. And, and I think they are, they are quite useful. Of course, we still don't have a sufficient number of, of cameras installed, so the network is still poor. Uh, we still need to analyze better the the information if it is precise enough, because we can even, we can probably capture the shape of the contrail. But what happens with the with the ice properties? Is there enough information in the ground camera to capture the the properties of the ice crystals? Uh, can we use visible the visible domain combined with infrared domain? And I know these cameras have uh, the, these two uh, bands to also do a bit of radiative transfer calculations and also do a better esti estimation of radiative, uh, of radiative transfer of contrails instead of using the satellite information. That's another another uh, way to use ground cameras. So it's not the only way to go. It's not the holy grail, but it's true that it's providing uh, complementary information to the one we could have from satellites. And also, of course, we should ambition to combine this information with uh, onboard sensors, as you might imagine, which would provide a uh, really, really uh, the, the better information or the best information we can have. This is the great thing when you have a professor on because you, you ask a specific question, but you get the entire breakdown in a really logical manner. So I, I appreciate that. And you already tapped into a lot of the topics that are part of the e-contrails project. It's a project within César. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone interested, we had Alain Cybert, the CTO of César, already on in episode 22, where he gave a high-level overview. And now this is one of the projects within that umbrella, and it deals with contrail management. And it has the four elements, contrail detection, ice cloud radiative forcing quantification, then Contrail radiative forcing prediction, and last but not least, a visualization dashboard. Mm -hmm, exactly. You already touched on on some of these aspects. Uh, I have a question about the contrail detection part. And uh, since you already mentioned the Go satellite and the Meteo set, and since um, a lot of the the data um, that is being utilized within eContrails is uh, used from the Meteo set third generation satellite. I wonder what your views are on the delays in the data availability from, from the satellite and how your project will deal with this. The consortium of eContrail is composed by KTH in Sweden and then two partners in, in Belgium, BIRA, the, Institute, uh, the Belgian Institute of Aeronomy and Astronomy, and then the Royal Meteorological Institute, also in Belgium. And the Royal Meteorological Institute was on board of 
the metastatic generation uh, satellite and some of the instruments, and they, they, they have access to the information. We were supposed to get the data, the Metrosat third generation uh, satellite data in December, but uh, there was an error in the data, a calibration error. Uh, indeed, we were testing some some images, but there, there were some uh, kind of lines that, that our algorithms were detecting as contrails, so a bit of background image. In any case, they, they are still recalibrating the system and we don't know when the data is going to be available. Okay, it's true that the Meteosat third generation satellite or the, the, the spectrometer that they, they have on board, I think it's called FCI, it is supposed to have the same uh, number of spectral channels, the same bands, the same spatial temporal resolution as the one we have in GOES. So it's exactly the same type of instrument, but pointing to Europe and Africa. Okay, so in Europe, one of the problems is that we didn't have any level data set any ground truth. So all our efforts, and I think all the community in general, is looking at the GOES data set shared by, by Google in, in the competition they launched last, last spring, one year ago, more or less. And, and we are developing algorithms on, on this data set and evaluating the figures of merit uh, against the ones that, that were have been published and those uh, competitors that, are, that uh, attended the, the call. And well, we have uh, done an algorithm based on instant segmentation. So we have modified the, the information provided by GOES, which is a, a, a mask, pixel-based mask, to instance instancing each of the contrails. So we have developed an automatic algorithm to transform the mask and generate a, another data set that in which we have identified each of the contrails, and then being able to apply instant segmentation approaches to the tech contrails. We are about to publish a paper, so stay tuned. Uh, we, but we've been able to uh, get very high dice scores up to 80%, right? Which means that we have a very high precision and very high recall. So meaning that we can have a high number of high rate of true positives. So we are missing very little of, of the, the contrails that were identified by the labels. But we are also having very, very low rate of false positives, right? So this is important when it comes to really reducing uncertainties in, in, in contrail impact. First of all, we need to detect as much as, as possible the number of contrails and reduce as much as possible the false positives. Of course, we know that this data set was created by humans and it's human bias. So it's not the real ground truth, but well, I think it's a, it's a good uh, benchmarking tool for the scientific community. So we are doing that, and we are transferring that those models to the Meteosat second generation satellite information, okay, which has a lower number of spectral bands and has lower spatial temporal resolution. These instant segmentation algorithms are very sensitive to the resolution. Okay, so we have found some problems in transferring the models that we have trained on GOES to the European dataset, but we have been able to, to obtain good results. We do believe that the transferring is going to be automatic with the Metasat third generation information. So all the algorithms that are being trained today on the GOES dataset are going to be transferred easily to European dataset because it's the same type of information. And when it comes to the Metrosat second generation, which is what we, we have decided to do, because it's the information we have, and we are being uh, funded by Cesar, it's a European project. Europe is behind the States, the United States, in this domain, let's be clear. So we need to make efforts also into bringing the, the US knowledge to Europe with its uh, singularities. So we will be publishing something soon, stay tuned. Uh, with these uh, new new methods, the, the metrics, the, the results, and how can we transfer information to the European the European available data sets. Okay, we could also rely on low low Earth orbiting satellites, but we know that this is not right in a continuous image for the globe. It has its own problems. We could also do it with ground cameras, but this is another story, right? So this is the way we are we are following in econ trade. So it was a it is a pity that we don't have MTG. There are ways to to 
circumvent this issue. But we hope to have the data soon and we hope to transfer the the models soon. And I guess all the community will be able to do it. Yeah, it seems that this is a really great workaround and um, and that you're uh, still able to progress the certainty that we have in that area uh, while preparing actually to have access to, to that kind of a, a data. And one of the things that you want to quantify is the ice cloud radiative forcing. And this is important to note because eventually... There are many steps in a data chain, you know, many things to be done. But eventually what we want to mitigate is the heating up of the earth, right? And um, the RF is essentially the, the metric that is closest, right, uh, or at the end of that chain. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, are we able to really measure that? And, and how do we do that from satellite data? First of all, the RF is or the radiative forcing is a combination of, of the shortwave incoming radiation from the Earth, and we have the clouds that are somehow reflecting part of that incoming radiation. We are talking about 300 um, watts per square meter, the, the kind of three, four, five hundred watts per square meter, the, the energy that the sun is inputting to the Earth. It depends a lot of the solar zenith, Right, it depends on the source and it a lot, but we are talking about these magnitudes. Okay, I'm, I'm saying that because I will give you a number uh, in in few minutes. Then we also have the the long wave radiation that the Earth is emitting back to the atmosphere and, in principle, to to the space. Right, and this is the type of energy that the the clouds are kind of uh, trapping. That they are capturing that that energy. So there is a, a balance between incoming and outgoing radiation, as I guess your uh, audience knows. Well, here we need to co to compute both, right? Incoming or short wave and outgoing or long wave radiation. The RF, the radiative forcing, depends on two things: the optical cloud properties, right? So we from the satellite images, we can retrieve optical cloud properties, so the properties of the ice crystals, uh, optical depth, the top pressure, effective radius, there are, there are many of them, right? Uh, and we can retrieve that from, from satellites. The, the more resolution, the better. And again, we have geostationary satellites, we have low Earth orbiting satellites that might have more resolution, but, but the temporal um, resolution is, is lower. So here uh, we have different options. Together with the optical, which is basically the crystal, okay, the crystals that, that we are developing, uh, together with that, we need to pay attention to the solar zenith angle. It's not the same to have the, sol the sun on top than having it in the early morning, more tangential, uh, and the surface albedo. It's very important to pay attention to the surface because it's not the same to analyze a pixel on top of the ocean than analyzing a pixel in the desert or maybe in a uh, in a forest. So there are many different, uh, there is a categorization of different surfaces, different albedos, and this is also important to, to take into consideration that. And then the temperature that you have in, in, the, in the surface. So combining all those properties, you can, you can uh, characterize each pixel of the image. What is the, the property of the crystal? What is the solar, solar zenith angle? What is the surface? Okay, a different time instance of the day. And then you need to apply a radiative uh, transfer model. So there is a combination of observation means, remote sensing devices, and uh, radiative transfer models. There are, there are some of them in the literature that, that you can use. We use LibraTran, which I am not the expert on that, so I'm not going gonna, gonna to be able to explain um, many in detail these things. There is people also in University of Sorbonne doing uh, research in the same direction that, that we are. In our team is the Royal Meteorological Institute, the ones that are doing this research. And well, the idea that we have, we want to build, we have run a lot of simulations. We have extracted a lot of, of those properties, the properties of the cloud, the different conditions of the sun for different surfaces. And we have run uh, short wave, long wave, radiative transfer models. And we have created a very big table, a lookup table, right? That we want to, uh, we're going to publish another paper on that soon. And the idea is to also offer that to the community 
as I guess you you know, the community knows that in Europe we are working in something called Contrailnet. It's been led by Eurocontrol, in which we want to build a database for Contrail observation, but not only for Contrail observation. And and incorporating related transfer information could be also interesting, and we are in conversations for that. But but then with that table, the problem is that those computations are expensive. So we we cannot really do that for the whole European airspace in a in a real time basis. So we have done all these simulations that are quite expensive. We have created this table, and the idea is to retrieve the information that we have today. We get we access today to the geostationary satellite information. We retrieve the cloud properties. We have already the the surface information, and for the position of the sun and for the temperature that we are now experiencing, we can go to the table, look up and retrieve short wave and long wave radiative transfer, uh, radiative uh, forcing information. And this is what we want to do. The question is how accurate that is, right? Because we were talking about accuracy when it comes to detection through positives, um, false negatives. But now in the in this chain of data, if we add on top of those aviation-induced contrails and aviation-induced cloudiness, the RF, how accurate can we be? Well, we want to compare our results with a, a system, a radiometer, because the, the systems that we use for that are called radiometers. And there is a satellite that has been launched a couple of months ago called EarthCare, that is a low Earth orbiting satellite. It's going to be providing data, I think, twice a day. On, on a specific region of Europe. But the idea is to compare our results using this big table with the information provided by the uh, this radiometer, the, well, the Earth Care instrument. And, and the accuracy of that instrument, as 35, is 10 watts per square meter. Okay, so we were talking before that the order of magnitude of the incoming radiation is three, four, 500, uh, watts per square meter, the accuracy of this instrument is 10 watts per square meter. So this gives you an idea of, of the accuracy that we can have. Of course, when we incorporate clouds into the equation, mm, things uh, are a bit complex. The radiative forcing calculations in geosciences is well established. The problem is to discriminate between natural cloudiness, natural contrails, natural cirrus, natural crystals, and those induced by aviation, those linear contrails and those cirrus clouds that have been induced by aviation. And this is what we are doing in the contrail project. We are, first of all, estimating or, or um, detecting contrails. And then with the relative forcing maps that uh, our colleagues at RMI are providing to us, we are doing the intersection. We are discriminating or putting out all what is supposed to be natural and just retaining those. Uh, artificial ones. And the problem here is that detecting linear contrails, detecting lines in an image is easy. Easy. It's an object. But understanding how linear contrails evolve, how mix and turn into a cloud, this is not that straightforward. Training detection algorithms to capture that might require incorporating physics driven models to some extent, into the equation. And this is something we are also doing, okay? Because the, the temporal evolution of the linear contrail, you know, you have maybe four or five contrails that are being developed, and all of a sudden in, in, an, in an image, you can see it with your eyes. At some point, they have disappeared, and then you have a cloud. How to discriminate? How to tell your artificial intelligence tool that this is an artificial contrail, but it's not uh, a natural cloud? It's not, it's not a straightforward. That's a challenging part because they are supposed to be contributing way more than linear contrails, as one might imagine. So the, when you get this cirrus cloud, this is contributing more than linear contrails. Since you mentioned some of the uncertainties, I want to zoom out a little bit more uh, because I often hear that you know, the, even the choice of using COSIP, for example, you know, is, is already quite an important choice. And one could also, uh, for example, use ACCFs on a high level. Do you think that uh, right now the community is relying too much on COSIP? I would say yes. 
Yes, there is uh, commonly most of the people is relying on COSI. I think we need to intercompare all the models. There is also AppChem that uh, has been released uh, recently and then some people is working on it. We have ACCF that is completely different, other metrics, uh, other species taking into account, other approach. But I think uh, understanding also uncertainties coming from using different models is important. There will be new models. There will be new versions of ACCF. For sure, we're going to start a project in September. Uh, for sure, uh, COSIP will have a new a new model. And the idea is to converge towards something that is actually capturing uh, contrails and its impact in a good way. Today, I think that's not the case still. So we need to work. The community needs to work in that direction. Starting from next year, we will measure, report, and verify. And um, this means that in, in this month, since a couple of days ago, actually, um, there is the, the consultation is open by the European Commission. So now um, input is being gathered on what to measure, in what scope it has to be measured, and, and how exactly. And right now, the MRV relies... That's the things that uh, that are public right now um, relies very strongly on physics based models and um, observations don't play a huge part in in that um, chain in that chain of you know weather data control simulation and then climate impact metrics. Do you think we should include observations more in the actual quantification? Yes, absolutely. I think well the key atmospheric parameter clearly is relative humidity. Okay, I know there is a report by IATA in which they are claiming that, and I know it's going to be very difficult to equip uh, all the aircraft or many aircraft with uh, sensors that are expensive uh, that might require, I don't know, if, if certification. I mean, that's that's a challenging, but it's true that the the element, the atmospheric element that is key, that is really driving the formation and in which we really have uncertainty today is relative humidity. Also, it's, it's, it's something that we cannot measure from, from other... We cannot, we cannot know it unless we really place a, a sensor on board. I don't know if that's going to be possible or not, but it will be quite interesting to have some aircraft, some more than what, what we have, because Jagos is, is, is... We have very few uh, aircraft providing those, those data, and the data sometimes is not uh, in, in, good, in good shape. So we really need to go in that direction. That's for sure. How expensive and how to do it? I don't know who has to pay for it. I don't know. But uh, that's a way to go. Then placing a camera, as when we are skiing or with a bike, we have a camera here, uh, maybe somewhere in the aircraft to really see the, the trail and really get to understand better this initial phases of formation, microphysics, all the nucleation, because that's that's key also. That's key, especially if we move from kerosene combustion. We, we can now monitor what's going on with uh, kerosene fuels, but what happens with SAF? What happens with hydrogen? We will probably, we could also measure something on SAF, but this might also help us developing models to understand to which extent uh, we need to go into more into SAF or more into hydrogen or not, because the non-CO2 impacts in particular, the contrails are still uh, uncertain. It's true that I, I, I attended to Pi Contrails and I saw uh, a couple of nice publications, uh, including observations and measurements uh, uh, of SAF, and that was quite uh, interesting and revealing, I would say. But placing a camera, answering your question, uh, it will be quite interesting. Combined with ground cameras and with satellites, again, the more visual information we have, the better. And of course, we're going to be able to use that. Uh, combining AI with physics-driven models, there are, there are, I was talking about imaging painting, we, we are using physics in formula neural networks. We can embed, I mean, Stokes, we can embed uh, fluid mechanics into into deep learning models and architectures, and and we can really do a lot of things with that. Right, and in the podcast tradition, um, there is one more open question because in the that tradition, the previous guest passed on a question to you, and um, it was a guest from the German Weather Service, Dr. Carmen Emmel, and 
I think you covered a couple of these aspects already and probably um, you don't like me for asking this very last minute because you could elaborate uh, much in depth. But her question was, do you have an idea how neural networks could help in the assessment of water vapor measurements? First, we have used neural networks as predictors. Okay, so we, we by capturing observations, I don't care if we're talking about a thunderstorm, a water vapor measurement, or a contrail with its uh, RF. If we are able to collect a dense enough number of measurements, and this is important, okay? We need to collect, it's, it's not just one measurement. We need to have a, a dense number of measurements. And we can somehow relate that with prediction. So imagine we have the numerical weather prediction that we were expecting for, for that particular measurement. So we have that for a year, one year of data with the numerical weather prediction. And the measurement, we can really train an neural network to predict that. I don't care if we're talking about a thunderstorm, contrail, or water vapor. Uh, so that's one thing. Then if we are talking about, I don't know exactly what they want to do, but if we're talking about improving the quality of that measurement, that's also something that we can do. Okay, We can try to embed the physical process. It's like a calibration. It, it could be like a calibration. You, you could kind of combine, it could, like a filter if you want, you could, you could combine some sort of physic, physical model in which you are integrating partial differential equation or ordinary differential equation or, or a system and then combining it with, with measurements trying to somehow filter out noises and, 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 and get a better estimate of that particular measurement. But I don't really know the context, so I don't know how to to answer that question. Maybe maybe this is unsatisfying for some people, but maybe this is also a good conversation starter for others. Yeah. So maybe this uh, is a good starter um, since you know Carmen is is looking um, at it from the you know weather forecasting angle, and uh, and and you can certainly complement that um, by other angles. So um, maybe start a conversation, but also. You have the chance to pass on a question, putting you on the spot here. And the next guest is someone who is involved in policy making. Okay. And that is Ewan Mitchison from EasyJet. Mm -hmm. He will bring his airline's perspective on, on policy management right now in the context of, of contract management. So you have the chance to pass on a question. Okay. The, the question for, for, for him, any airline, I would say, would be how much? would you be willing to, to pay in order to mitigate climate change? And some studies in which I've been involved are saying that uh, a marginal cost, I don't know if, if 0.05%, 0.5%, less than 1% in any case, could lead to a contrail or a, a aviation use uh, mitigation of uh, 50, 60, 70% in some cases. When it comes to contrails, maybe if we combine all the others, it's more in the 20, 30, 40%. In any case, an important number. So how much would the airline be willing to pay? How would the airline be transferring that to the end user? Because we are supposed to have sensitivity. Are we, as users, willing to pay more for a flight ticket if they tell us that, that they are green? And the, third, the, the, the last question is how they think airlines, the governments or authorities need to subsidize them or there should be a taxation there should be how to incentivize that in which way should we go into a non-co2 market should we exchange uh, tokens priorities what's the way to go it's clear that we first of all need to quantify and for that we need to reduce uncertainties in all the models so i think we need to go back to our <laughs> the, the beginning of our talk but uh yeah uh, I would like to hear from from, from himself his his perspective on on this. I think it's quite interesting and is the way uh, to go in the end. It'll certainly be a good perspective, and this leads me to the end to conclude this episode. Manuel, I really appreciate all of your answers. It was a diverse spectrum of topics which we covered, even though um, it is within this niche, and. You have a couple of resources that I could attach to this episode in the show notes. Is there any one paper or any kind of resource that you'd like to highlight right now that I should promote? Uh, we have uh, recently uh, published a preprint precisely on, on my last comment. 
the optimization of trajectories incorporating climate change. And it's called Pathways to Sustainable Aviation, Aligning Flight Plans with Climate Goals. Uh, it's under review still in, in communications, uh, earth and environment. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a nice uh, large scale analysis uh, on oriented towards policy making. Because when it comes to Econ Trail, we're still on the making. We will publish something this summer for sure, but still nothing is, is ready to be shared, unfortunately. But soon, just stay tuned. Yes, you plucked a lot of interesting reports and papers here. And the audience is now, I think, really um, has really a lot of resources to dive into. Manuel, thank you very much for taking part. This was great. And speak soon. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. And thank you. Speak soon, for sure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.